this is really a historic moment as we enter the next phase of the movement to the rooting and releasing of the 440ers. There was such a similar moment several thousand years, years ago when God entered into the covenant uh, with Abraham about raising up a generation. He was not just to Abraham cre to create a great nation, but also reminded Abraham that apart from his corporate responsibilities, he was to pay attention to teach your children and your household to follow the Lord. So the blessings of the covenant will continue on. It was a covenant which was of intergenerational in nature. There was another historic moment when God felt the time was near, was ready for the nation of Israel to enter the promised land. In the midst of instructing the nation as a corporate body to look into different aspects of living so that they'll enter the promised land to enjoy the full benefits of the promise. In the midst of that, those instructions given to the corporate body as well as individuals in their community. In the second speech, part of the second speech of Moses on the plain of Moab, it came to a part of that is to instruct the parents. Come into a place and say, apart from moving as a body, things we must do as a corporate body, there are specific roles and responsibilities given to the families. Turning away from the assembly to the families in particular, clear instructions were given to the families. Not only corporately we need to do certain things to follow certain ways in order to succeed in the land of promise, but without the families doing the right thing, we can't make it. Even though we are eager as a group to raise up a generation of 414 ers which is very essential to continue in that land, not only go into conquered that land, but to be able to stay in and enjoy the prosperity of that land. But yet, turning away from the overall assembly, Moses looked at the families and said, apart from what we do together, you must do something with your families. Impress upon your children Learn what you have learned, but take time to look after your children. Impart, impress into, into them, teach them diligently the ways of the Lord. Why? It is in the context of passing on faith. It is the strength, the faith within each child who will grow up in this promised land, who will carry on and enjoy the benefits of the land. Every parent was told that you must diligently teach your children. Why? Because every one of you is positioned with certain things I equip you with. You don't have an excuse, number one. You have the relationship. You have the proximity. You have the teachable moments. You have the home. You remember Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 and 9, covering the different circumstances being there with the children. At home, walking along the road, when you lie down, when you're awake, no one else in the community able to recognize those moments, those moments that your children will be ready to receive the truth, be able to relate the circumstances to the biblical truth, able to continue to focus your eyes upon Jehovah God, 
in a daily living. You parents are there. You are the one to, to ensure that you will continue on to live. And their children and the children after them. It also requires the parents. You see, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6, these commandments are to be upon your hearts. It's not simply memorize those commandments, but to be able to live a life loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And not only that, but to be able to really able to impart, learn enough to able to t- uh, utilize the, those teachable moments and impart those truths so that the, the impartation be effect, so effective, not only for your children, but they will carry something with them that they will ever carry on and impart faith to the next generation. Another time is Apostle Paul. Believing it's a secular letter to the Christian church. How do we live as Christians? We know the first three books is more doctrinal in nature. The second, the second part of three, letter three chapters dealing with the practical aspect of Christian living. Again, Apostle Paul looking at what needs to be done, telling the people how, how to live as members of the body. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says, live a life worthy of your calling. But in the midst of that, turning away again from the assembly of the people, the church, looking at the families and say this to the parents, to the fathers. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, fathers, raise your children up in the, in the training and instruction of the Lord. It is not asking the community to be really primarily responsible to train your children. You. Home. You want to raise four fortiness. Home. Because why we are we are there. There are teachable moments. The church will not have those moments, not that many moments in the two hours they spend with us each Sunday. But parents, we have the home. We have the environment. We have the relationships. We have, we are there. We know whether our teenager is straying or not. We know them, the way they walk in through the door. We know what kind of condition he's in or she's in. We are there. And with all this being be there, God is telling us, you are responsible. You are primarily responsible. The church is there to equip you. In chapter 4 of the book Ephesians, verse 12, the church is there with different giftings to equip the saints for the work of service. Part of the service is service in the homes. That is why we are there. The church is to support the homes. But do you know what? As much as we know the call upon the parents to be the leaders of the home, we must recognize this truth. And sometimes we forget this. In the divine order of the home and the church, we forget the issue of jurisdiction. The church is being given certain jurisdiction over the community of believers. Do you know there is a specific authority and jurisdiction given to the family? There is a place that parents are primarily responsible for shaping the lives of the children. The church, the body of Christ, is there to equip the parents. This is their role. This is their jurisdiction. As far as the family is concerned, they are there to nurture the children, to follow the ways of the Lord. They are primarily responsible because of the position they are in. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, the two key institutions that God established to advance the kingdom of God, we need to recognize there is such a thing called jurisdiction that we cannot encroach to each 
others' area of that responsibility. If we and you and I have been ministering in the church environment long enough, in the history of the church, and we also encounter numerous occasions that very often, and this generally speaking globally, even right now, the church is taking over the responsibility that should be in the hands of the parents. In very, using a very crude word, it's called encroachment. They are going to area that we should not barge into. The parents are responsible. I won't go into historical, historical reasons why we end up this way. We are about to go into another phase of our movement. I'm just wondering, how are we? You see, it is one thing to involve our parents or really reaching out to reach and rescue children and get them into an equipping track or come to an environment that we can make impacts upon them. But it is another thing to tell the parents that we're going to root your children, disciple your children, and release your children. You see, I'm a parent of two, two boys. As a Christian, can you imagine this? We go out and tell the pa- someone will come and tell me and say, Matthew, I want to turn your older boy and a younger boy to be world changers. I will first thing I'll say, yeah! But in my mind, if you can help my boy to achieve well in life in terms to professionally and uh, get a good income and live a good life on earth, marry someone nice, I will say yes. But if you tell me war changer means that we're going to give the kingdom of God the priority, you're going to change community because you're going to be the salt and the light, there is a whole different ball game altogether. I think this is where I think as we spend time like this together, it is so vital for us to recognize the family factor in our movement. Because if we do not handle this delicate issue properly, we will turn the parents as our faults. They will be opposing us, which they have been. We need them to be our partners. We need them really to be a strategic partner. Besides persuading them this is the way to go, because we also know that, again, generally speaking, globally, there has been great lack in the readiness of the church to nurture parents who have the capacity to nurture forefortiness that we set out to achieve. We need a four fourteen window family. Each family has a capacity, not just about talk about this, but they do and follow a particular pattern of raising up four fourteeners in their midst. This is not simply of having a program. I think the church needs to come to a place to recognize this. There are issues in the families right now that we are facing which are serious. We all know that the, 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 uh, the family meltdown statistics is on the tremendous rise in recent decades. Every country is not, none of the countries in the world is spare of this. But these are the surface evidence, evidences of spiritual, tremendous spiritual attacks on our families. How can we try to nurture four faultiness when our families are struggling, facing divorces. Family parents are just so discouraged. Or there is a tremendous lack of leadership in the home, abandonment, lack of fatherhood, lack of just being together. These are just some of the areas I pick up from the book Ephesians chapter 5. The really the issue is this. I think we need to come to a place of 
thinking, reflecting of what I've just shared in the last few moments, and begin to think of how can we look at one segment of the church. I'm so glad this movement has always been very clear in anchoring all the tasks through the ecclesia. This is a good strategy. But remember, a part of the ecclesia are the families. I know that we also talk about children whose parents are not in a church. Orphans, maybe natural orphans or created orphans, those who have been abandoned by parents who are just not taking good care of them. Remember Psalm chapter 68, verse 6. God set the lonely in families. Have you wondered why set the lonely in families? There's something unique in the family environment that will give every person the kind of, I would say, it's hard to describe the parental love, the love in the family, the dynamics of that place that will create the kind of, kind of special kind of love that any orphan coming to the family will be able to grow, be nurtured in their respect. This is quite an ambitious thought. We need a 414 window family. We need 414 window parents. But we cannot move ahead without the second strategic partnership is to, for the leadership to come to a place to recognize that families are important piece of that Jesus puzzle to move the movement on. We need a congregation where the, all the giftings and resources are to release this in partnership with the church, with the families, to raise, it, to raise up for fortiness. Ephesians 4, 16 says, as each part does its work. This is interesting. In the last few decades especially, there are hundreds and thousands of leaders, persons, organizations around the world who have responded to the tremendous needs in the families around the world. Because of that, I would say that church in general, not ready, not prepared, has not, had not got the infrastructure to recognize different needs in the body of Christ. These organizations have tremendous resources working supposedly in tandem with the church. It has not worked that well. I believe this is a Kairos moment as we recognize the role of the family not to come to a place of having that tussle with so-called family ministry providers who have that tremendous uh, heart to try and to support families, but to come to a place to recognize their place in the kingdom of God, in their contribution to the health of the families. This requires for the families to come to, to, to recognize this, for the leadership and the congregation of the church to come to the place to know what they lack? I always ask this question. When was the last time your church did a survey to find out the needs of the families in the body? If you don't know, how do you address that? We may start off with one or two programs to address certain issues but have you ever thought that those programs might not be enough? We say you cannot use plaster, medicated plaster, to try to solve a profusely bleeding wound. You can't. We need a fairly comprehensive family ministry structure to deal with that. I want to end with this thought. This thought is this. 
if when this movement is ready, and we are ready to move forward, we did, do need to consider seriously about the place of the family in this movement. How can we build those families up so that they can be partners with us together? And in this partnership, we shall have success. May God bless us as we bravely step forward into this phase of rooting and releasing children as a church together with the Christian families in our midst. The Lord bless you. Thank you.